So Lorena is our first guest and she's running for the AZ State House. She's a fifth generation Arizonian whose lifelong love of advocacy and leadership has been rooted in Mesa County for almost a century. Her grandparents uh, lived there and she was raised there. She has a passion for her community and working for her community. She proudly graduated from Mesa Community College as an honor student and student body president. She went on to graduate from the School of Trans Border Studies at ASU with a degree in Chicano Latino Studies, where she focused on U.S. and Mexican immigration policy and economy, and she obtained a certificate in cross-sector leadership. She's the granddaughter of farm workers and small business owners that worked and advocated for their community. She wishes to continue that legacy, investments in education, healthcare, and advocating to stop the displacement of her vibrant community due to rapidly rising housing costs are just some of the issues she plans to address head on should she win this election. And we're thrilled to have her. Thank you so much for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedule. I can only imagine how busy you are. Um, We're thrilled to have you and really looking forward to what you have to say. For everybody here, if you have questions for her, please put them in the chat, like we already said, and we'll have a few minutes for Q&A after Lorena finishes sharing with us. And you look like you're out on the road (laughs) we are yeah it's a busy uh busy day today but i'm super happy to thank you thank you for taking the time to join us go for it awesome um how much time do i have sorry total 15 minutes and if we could get some q a in there that'd be great absolutely um first of all i can never uh, start these conversations without saying a huge, immense thank you to Sister District because as an educator and first-time candidate, there's literally no way my campaign would have been viable without you all. So I just need you to know that the work that you're doing are literally impacting um, uh, races and promoting and supporting candidates that have a a very good real chance of helping put the legislature here in Arizona. So again, my name is Lorena Austin. I'm running for House Representatives in Legislative District 9 in Arizona, and that is uh, in Mesa, West Mesa, which is a suburb of Phoenix, um, just right outside Phoenix. And we have two precincts of Tempe, which you all might know mostly uh, associated with Arizona State University. Uh, but like I said, I'm an educator. I work at Mesa Community College, my local community college here as a student government advisor. I went to MCC. I was student body president. Uh, and then I transferred to Arizona State and got my degree in immigration policy and economy. Uh, but why this race is so important to me personally is my family has lived in this district for over 100 years. And we've actually lived in Arizona since the 1860s. So you can't get more, I think, Arizona rooted uh, then my family, I'm, uh, like I said, from Mesa, which uh, many, not too long ago, was a segregated community back in the 50s. My nana and tata owned a grocery store, Little Bandita, called Albert's Market, and they serviced all communities. So uh, it's been incredible, too, to, to knock doors and people remember my family and they remember uh, their generosity and how uh, they advocated for Mesa and everybody in Mesa. Um, my father was born in this segregated community. He's only 71 years old. He was out knocking doors with me today. Um, he, but when he was a kid, he remembers not being able to swim in the public swimming pool unless it was being cleaned that day. Uh, but he went on to be really active in the uh, Chicano movement, the civil rights movement in the Bay Area. My mom is actually from the Bay Area as well. She's from San Jose. So I always like to give that shout out. Uh, but so it's it's definitely my blood. It's, it's rooted. And so... Uh, Another reason why I'm so passionate about this district is because for the first time as a new district, it literally encompasses just kind of my hometown. You couldn't have cut it up any better than where I grew up. Um, And so to give you background on this district as well, like I said, it's the most competitive in Arizona this year. It is literally split 50-50 between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, We do have about a third independence as well. So it's been uh, super important that we get a ground game, that we have people supporting through text banking, phone banking, um, helping us get donations, because it's going to come down to who works the hardest uh, to get the votes here in LD9. 
I uh, will say, though, that the people we are running against are very extreme. I can't even put it lightly or say that they're moderate. Um, on one side, we have uh, Kathy Pierce, who is the sister of Russell Pierce. Who, if you don't know who that is, he was responsible uh, for SB 1070 and was Sheriff Joe Ohio in the immigration sweeps. And he was actually the so far the only sitting legislature, the legislator that's been recalled from the state of Arizona, and it was from this area. Uh, and then another woman named Marianne Mendoza, who I would tell you to look up her platform, uh, but you can't find her on social media because she was banned because she uh, continuously retweeted anti-Semitic tweets and white nationalist tweets and was cut from an RNC convention speaking this because of those reasons. So uh, there's a very extremist slate here, not just in our district, but in the state of Arizona, as we've seen past the primaries. So it's not a... Uh, need to, it's a half to win. So there's really no option, but they're not representative of our community. And I can tell you as someone who's grown up here, Mesa is a very vibrant, diverse community. And yes, we might have different opinions about different things, but we are not a racist, uh, uh, full of racist rhetoric in our community. That's just not um, gonna happen. So the things that are really important in my community and things that I'm advocating on uh, as an educator, obviously education is super important. We're 49th in the nation in funding education here in Arizona, which is just um, embarrassing. Um, and so we have to ensure that our students have a bright future, but have teachers that are qualified, uh, that are uh, paid well, that don't have to work more than one job just to get by. Uh, and we should be have legislators that listen to the will of the people as well, because in Arizona, overwhelmingly, people have voted to fund education. Uh, we had Prop 208, where it was a bipartisan effort to fully fund education. And the legislature uh, decided that that wasn't what the people wanted. And so we have to have a legislature that reflects the, the will of the people. Um, Housing is a big issue in our district as well. We're talking to people who've seen their rents increase $500, $600, and we're seeing displacement of our community and private investors coming and scooping up you know, family housing and, and selling it at a higher price or turning it into Airbnbs. Um, so I'm very convinced that in five to 10 years, if we don't do something about that, Mesa won't look like the Mesa that I know anymore. Um, and then obviously uh, climate is huge in Arizona, especially with water. So we're navigating that currently. We, we should be uh, one of the most sustainable energy producing uh, states with all the solar that we should have in the state. So I uh, really want to advocate to move towards that. And then um, abortion is something that has been on the front lines every single day when we knock doors, that is something people want to talk about. So it has galvanized people um, here in Arizona. Sometimes people might not think that given the demographics of our legislature, but it is something that people want to talk about. They are angry and we need a legislature uh, in the state that will advocate for the will uh, of our people and their health care needs. So that's a, a super quick synopsis and I will open it up to any questions anyone might have, but thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Lorena. That, that was fabulous. Um, I love how you can do this from your car with just yeah. <laughs> the greatest <Anyway>. of <laughs> Um Here's a, a question from Barb. I'm, I'm Holly. I'm, I'm one of the, the folks in the Sister District Swing Left Marin. And Barb has asked, if we make phone calls for you, what is the most important thing we should tell people about you? Yeah. Um... I think the thing that people resonate with the most is that I'm actually from my community because um, we said a lot of times, and I would say that in this race too, people were looking at targeting because we're a brand new district of just moving here to run because it was an easier pathway to the legislature. And that's why I really decided to run because I thought someone who's actually from here, who looks like our district, who understands the um, uniqueness of it and the diversity of our residents, because not everyone's a Democrat. Like I understand that. Um, and so I think, that's a big positive, but also I'm just real honest with people. I'm not trying to be some party politics savior. I just want to be someone who can actually build that rapport and trust with our community because I've been working in the community for a long time. Um, but I understand that there is a huge disconnect between our politicians and our community members. And there are resources that should be coming to my community, but haven't gotten uh, because I think of that lack of relationship. And I told that to a city council uh, during COVID. They had, I did a really good job of uh, collecting um, funds and COVID relief. And they came to community leaders and said, you know, why uh, we, people aren't coming to us to get these funds. And I said, why would they? 
because for so long, our communities have had to depend on one another. I'm not shocked they're not coming to you because they don't depend on you, period. Um, since the inception of this country, especially communities of color, we have a high Latinx community. It's about 40% in this district. So I'm really passionate about going into um, our districts, actually speaking to people, showing up at their doorstep more than once, asking for a vote. Um, and I've already, you know, on my second pass right now of houses and people are surprised that I come by. Um, I went out in a haboob the other day, which is a massive storm that we have here. And it was pouring rain, but I had volunteers with me and I said, I will come in the rain to your house. And that's what we did. That's the commitment that we have in this race. So I know that's a long, I'm sorry, that's a long answer. But I think the point is, is I will show up because if I lost this race, which I were not going to, I would be doing the same thing that I'm doing now because that's how much I care because this is my home. Um, and so I think that's what I would say. So if you can condense that for me, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah, I'm sure Barb took notes. I did. Well, we are glad to hear that. This is from Nitsa. Glad to uh, Nitsa. Glad to hear the people are concerned about choice. Sure. Uh, is protecting democracy getting much attention, or are the issues more local and personal? Do you find? I think on that regard, people are very tired of the vitriol, I think, overall. So um, my running mate is Seth Blattman, um, and he's that's one of his issues is, is uh, government reform and just bringing it back to the issues um, at hand and not politicizing it in a way. Because when we come to these doors, too, it's, it's really hard sometimes when people just say, well, are you a Democrat or a Republican? They want to know immediately before you even start having a conversation. But at those specific doors where you get to have just another extra sentence, you really find that you care about really at the base level the same thing. It's just a matter of having a conversation about how we identify those solutions for that thing. Because we have different lived experiences. So that makes sense to me. But it's really about breaking it down to such a um, a level to where, I mean, do you believe in education that every child should have an equal education? Well, yeah, yeah. Do you know that, especially here in Arizona, vouchers are siphoning from public education at the bottom and they're taking away from funds that should be directed to public schools. And then these charter schools and, uh, aren't regulated, you know, so there's things and, and they just don't know. So it's a lot of um, education. And so that's what I do. Right. So I love having these conversations with people. But um, yeah, people, I think, are tired of it all. So I think it's kind of a, a breath of fresh air when we show up to their door and actually have, you know, a, a conversation with somebody instead of feeding into this really politicized, you know, environment that we're currently in. Great. Um, you know, I, I'd like to know, this is, this is a tough thing that you're doing. What made you decide to, you know, put your life on hold and jump into this? I ask myself that all the time. Um, no, uh, I am a first time candidate. I am supposed to be at law school somewhere in the country right now. That's what I was doing because I came back to college after 10 years of being out from a higher education. So when, in 2006, I graduated high school and I didn't think I was cut out uh, for education. I never was good at math. So I thought that was the indicator of intelligence, which I think a lot of students think that and it's unfortunate, but it took me 10 years and um, the death of Michael Brown in St. Louis, where I was living to galvanize me to realize there's something I need to do. So I moved back to Mesa here in 2014, re-enrolled in the same community college I dropped out of five times 10 years earlier. And uh, that changed my life. And so I started becoming really active. I became student body president there, got my degree in sociology and then transferred to Arizona State. And then I graduated in 2020 when COVID hit. Um, and that was changed our lives. But I knew that my family always taught me to show up for your community and work hard. And so I started volunteering at the food banks and doing intake for the 3,000 cars that were coming through every day. Um, I helped uh, with the local business when the dining room shut down. We made it a collection center for PPE, toiletries, and food to take up to indigenous nations um, up north in Arizona because they had the highest rates of covid uh, infections and the government wasn't doing anything. So again, that's when community, you know, steps in. And so that was, you know, grueling, but worth it. And then this opportunity opened up and I was applying for law school and it, no one from my community was running. And I mm. just thought, you know what, law school can wait, but this can't. So I naive, naively threw my hat in the ring and it's uh, been the best thing I could have ever done. So it was, was not my intention in January, but that's how I got here. And I'm 
so happy because what I've learned, if I could give anyone a piece of advice that is, you know, thinking about it is you can teach someone how to learn policy easy. You cannot teach someone how to know your community. And that is the dang truth. So I'm super, super happy that I decided to write. Awesome. Well, I, I think we all agree with Barb who wrote in the chat. Oh, we wish we could live there and vote for you. <laughs> too. We're, we're, we're really too. fast. But to... you are helping. You have no idea for Swing Left and District District. You all have helped me so much. And I'm just... Well, give us, can you give us an idea of where, where does late... Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm getting a little delay on my computer. I think it's me. Um, where, where does late money go? Where, where do you put it in, in a campaign like this? Oh, uh, so I'm almost uh, depleted, not not depleted, but so I've raised about 130 so far, which our projections high is supposed to be like half a million and low is like 300,000. But so a lot of my money is about to literally leave my bank because of media. So it's going to mailing right now. It's going to digital media. We just had the digital firms out here and mailers. That's almost a hundred thousand dollars there. So all of this late money is going to help the rest of the campaign follow through to November. So it's super critical. And I get that too. And I would not have known that before this, um, but we still need to continue to pay staff uh, to get more literature out there doing, uh, we're just putting up signs as well. I know it sounds kind of late, but we also have like monsoon season here. So <laughs> we wait a few weeks later because they'll just get destroyed. And so signs are going up. So all those big ticket items that haven't been, are now leaving. So I'm not going to have that much left in the next few weeks, which is why it's super critical. So we can finish out November strong. What do you think is the biggest block to uh, getting out the vote? Um, getting out the democratic, you know what, your people, vote. And this is why going door to door and connecting with people is so important because also a lot of people feel defeated uh, by the government, you know, they feel like they don't care about them. You know, I've knocked on doors. One woman really sticks with me is she kind of just slammed her door in my face because she was like, they don't care about us. And I was trying to be like, but I'm not them yet. Or I, I don't never do be, but it's just really hard. Cause I think people have again and again been let down. You know, our teachers here, especially in Arizona have come out just year after year, trying to fight for whatever, um, little funding that they have. And again, the legislature just continues to say no. So when I'm at doors, you know, people will say, you know, why should I vote? I said, because of the past 30 years, the GOP has been in power. They are, if you're dissatisfied with what's going on in our state, it, that's fine. Um, and, you know, people ask me too, like, well, what are you going to specifically do when you get in? I said, listen, I can't do anything if we don't get at least 50 50 or a majority in the state. We are going to continue to see an even more like, the most extreme slate of candidates in the GOP I've ever seen. So they, in the primary two in Arizona, they've literally obliterated pretty much all the moderates in the, in the primary. So um, it's, it's scary, but I think when I express that to them, I think it just gets them a little more aware of what's going on. So I think the biggest difficulty, again, is creating that trust between somebody, that human connection and saying, hey, look at me. I'm here again on your doorstep. This is the second time you've seen me. And I'm committed to doing it a third time if I can before November. And then after that. So that's been the biggest challenge is trying to get people to believe in something again. There is a really uh, important question that, that just came up that we need to ask is, what is your favorite food? And Oof. how are you going to celebrate? Uh, what are you going to drink if you win? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, when, when, so when, so when, you, when, when you, you win, win. sorry, so when you win, what will you eat and drink? So there is an amazing uh, place here in um, Mesa called, called Adrian's, literally like number two. And it's just the most hole in the wall, like little Mexican restaurant that sits in front of like a trailer park here. And it has the best, the best machaca purito, like of all time, which is really good. Um, it just sounds really good right now. And then it's <laughs> uh, it I really like, um, I'll probably have a, a what do you call uh, An old fashioned, sorry. 
an old fashioned made with, um, I'm going to shout him out. He's wonderful. It's this place called Iron Root Republic in Texas. And one of my best friends owns this distillery in Texas and he's the most wonderful human being. And they just won the world corn whiskey awards in, in Europe. And so talk about a really invested in community person. So Iron Root Republic, but I will make an old fashioned with his, with his whiskey. Root. Yes. Well, it's a piece of good news. Our goal for today was 1500 and we've surpassed it. We're at 1700. Oh my gosh. So hey, we'll yeah. that be was able to help problem. you. Y'all didn't even have to do that, but I appreciate it. I mean, I know that's why oh, I, I, I never, we're here. I'm probably bad at this too. I'm so, <laughs> hey, thank, never, you. Like, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I never come with that intention, but um, I am super appreciative of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I can't oh, believe that gosh. people like actually do that for me sometimes. Oh, but. absolutely. Shoot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, can I ask another question? Sure. Okay, so Kevin was curious if gun control is part of the discussion in your district and how you handle it. Um, a lot of people, that does come up. People usually frame it in like, I, I support First and Second Amendment. Do you support First and Second Amendment? Um, I do support the First Amendment, but I don't think a lot of people know what that, knows what that means a lot of times. Um, they're very uninformed. I work in a law office too. Uh, that's one of my three jobs. So uh, it's, it's interesting navigating that, but with gun control, when I frame it away, so I personally, I grew up with guns. Like I, my family used to hunt, we used to hunt deer every year. So we would keep it and, and that was our food, you know, supply for a little bit of the year. Um, but man, my family, it was so strict. I had to go to classes. I had to learn everything about it. I never knew where the guns were growing up. Absolutely not. So when you frame it in terms of like responsible gun control, like if I have to buy, show my ID to buy Sudafed, like, I really think we should be regulating you know, <laughs> how many bullets you can purchase. And that one always gets them like, yeah, you do have to do that. I'm like, yeah, but you don't have to show that to buy a bullet that it can lethally, you know, annihilate something or someone or kill somebody. And so I really try to frame it in like responsible gun, you know, control. And I haven't really found someone that didn't disagree with me on that avenue. Um, the issue of like AK 47s and things like that. Um, I don't believe that's something that's a military grade weapon, you know, I think something that should be in our streets. Um, but I think when you frame it that way, because people are very serious about their guns here in Arizona, we have virtually no restrictions on them. Um, mm, mm. But when I frame it in like a responsible way, they usually agree with me because I mean, I don't, I don't think Arizona in general will do have a mass, you know, uh, disagreement on mine. Um, getting rid of guns but if i can frame it like that at least they're very receptive to it you are really inspiring to us and um now this has been such a nice opportunity I and mean, you can read about people you can see their picture but it's really nice to actually have the, this opportunity to have a real conversation with you um absolutely oh, wait where are you all where specific are you in sonoma um most of us are in uh Around Marin County, north of the, the Golden Gate in, near San Francisco. A yeah. few people a little bit further north, maybe. Yeah, that's amazing. So I grew up for a short period of time. I went to high school in Fresno, so I know oh, yeah. pretty well. And like I said, my mom's from San Jose and my grandparents, her parents, they were farm workers. And so where, you know, Google is now in Silicon Valley, I like grandma used to show me around and that's where they used to, you know, pick citrus and like work the field. So mm. uh, super, super close connection to the Bay area. My dad went to Santa Clara university. Wow. And then, like I said, they, my, both my parents were very involved in the Chicano movement. And then he got arrested at a protest and decided he would never want to get arrested again. So he applied for Berkeley law school where it was like $300 a semester, which is unreal to me. He had a part-time job. And then he went to Berkeley law school and graduated from Wow. Yeah. Your parents must be really proud of you. Yeah. They're, <laughs> my dad was like, are you sure you want to do this? Because um, he's been so active. But yeah, like I said, he was knocking doors with me this morning, 71, and, and still committed to the cause. Are you finding it hard to get young people excited about voting or to come out in this campaign, in this election? Um, yes and no. I mean, I wish there were more. I wish we had more young people, but I think too, as school is starting back up again, we just started last week 
here in Arizona, all the colleges and universities. Um, I think we're starting to be, see more student involvement. And I do think more towards October, September, we'll start seeing them come out more. But they're amazing. I love this generation. I know people want to give them, you know, crap sometimes, but they they show up. They're so smart. They have so much access to information. Yeah. They're knowledgeable and they're just not here for it. They're not here for, you know, uh, racism, you know, homophobia, like none of that. They are just so aware. And so I love working with them. They're just really great. And I'm excited. And plus, since I went back to school later, I got to just go to school with a lot of them. Um, and I'll tell you, they're going to change the world. I mean, they are ready for it and they are doing um, really creative, inventive things and they're not apologetic about it either. Uh, so I, I oh, really love yeah. them. <laughs> and I'm trying to get as many as I can to help okay. out. But yeah, they're great. Do you, have you found, uh, how does voter suppression factor in, um, in Arizona and um, observed? I, you know, like I would say, actually, Arizona elections are done really well. There's so much hatred about it, especially when we have a great early voter um, system here uh, early uh, for ballots. So they get mailed out to us and they come back. But they're really trying to come hard um, against people harvesting ballots. So like now it could be um, a felony if you brought your parents ballot for them who can't go out of their house or you know, so they are, there are def definitely what they're trying to make it harder. Uh, but if, if Mark Fincham gets elected and becomes secretary of state, we're going to have a real big problem um, because they want to get rid of everything. They want to get early voting. Um, they want to get rid of a lot of improvements that we've made. Like we currently have uh, polling stations that are for the entire county. So you can go to this one and you don't, it doesn't have to be your specific polling place. So we currently have like drop boxes too at these polling locations. So I, I, the system as it stands right now, yes, it's suppressive, but it's really a good one and a lot better than some other states, I will say. It's very secure. Um, they've done a great job because they've had a good foundation from when Adrian Fontes was here. He was Maricopa County reporter, and he did a great job um, of, of making these newer improvements and making it more accessible. But if we don't, um, if we don't elect him for secretary of state now, like it will be so drastically different. We probably won't have to be voting. We won't have uh, vote anywhere, polling places. Uh, it will probably be a felony to even look at a drop box because we won't have them. But uh, so, yeah, it's really scary. Currently, as it stands, I do believe we have very secure elections, but we won't if, if we don't get uh, Democrats in office. Yeah. Lorena, I, I'm going to cut in now. Um, we, we are going to let you go. It has been so inspiring to have you. My name's Elisa. Really, really pleased to um, have a chance to meet you like this. Um, you, I think with, with young leaders like you, um, I, I am so optimistic about the future and really, really grateful that you spent as much time as you did with us. You gave us more than, more than you promised. Um, and I hope that, yeah, that we'll continue to support you through the election. Awesome. Thank you. So, yay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Well, I won't get it done without people like you, and I sincerely, sincerely mean that. So um, thank you for your support. I'm, I'm blown away by it all the time. So that's why I'm more than happy to spend my time with you all, because that matters to me. Um, people tell me, don't spend so much time at the door, but you'll find me there for like 20, 30 minutes with people, because I believe in that, and I think it's important. So thank you so, so much. You're very welcome. Thank We're you. gonna try to get you some more. <laughs> yeah, Thank yes. you. All right. In fact, I've got a match to announce in a second. So oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Take Thank care, everybody. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>